we will yeah. get started then as everyone continues to join in. Good morning, everyone. My name is Loretta Lyons. I'm the programming librarian at Guilford Free Library. Today's program is the final talk in a three-part series with Bob Potter on the modern masters, great artists of the 20th century. The focus today will be on the artists of New York, New York. Thank you to Syl for co-sponsoring this series with the library. Art lecture presenter Bob Potter is a graduate of Syracuse University's School of Visual and Performing Arts. He spent his early career as an art director and creative director for leading media companies, including Scholastic Magazines, Time Warner, and National Geographic. He was a corporate development officer for the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Over the past decade, he managed an innovative art therapy program for Save the Children, headed marketing and communications for Mystic Seaport Museum, launched a professional development program for art students at the Lyme Academy College of Fine Arts, and is a docent at the Yale Center for British Art. So we will take an intermission today for questions. You can type those questions using your Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen. And we'll also have questions at the end of the program as well. So now please join me in welcoming Bob Potter. Thank you, Loretta. And, and thanks again to the Guilford Library and Sill for hosting this art series. Uh, it's really nice to be back with all of you on Zoom. And this week we're going to spend time with a group of artists who would take a revolutionary stand against realism in painting. We'll be exploring the works of Jackson Pollock, Frank Stella, Helen Frankenthaler, William de Kooning, and Jasper Johns. In the early 1950s, in Springs, Long Island, near East Hampton, in his garage studio, Jackson Pollock would spread his canvas on the floor nearly seven by 13 feet, light a cigarette, grab a bucket of house paint and brushes, and physically slash and drip paint in swirling explosive gestures of color shapes and forms. The end result would shock and change art forever. Both the public and critics would never be the same again in what they saw and considered to be art. And today, as we stand in front of a Jackson Pollock painting, Many are still asking the same question. Is this art? Let's take a moment to learn a little more about abstract expressionism in this short video. When you talk about abstract expressionism, you're really talking not about a consistent tendency, but about a variety of people who broke into their own voice or their own manner at roughly the same time under circumstances which influenced how that happened, but in each case it happened differently. I think everybody from 1945 on is looking for some sort of sense of salvation in the aftermath of World War II. And I think the modernists who came of age during this time period, everybody from Jack Kerouac to Allen Ginsberg, to the abstract expressionists themselves are trying to find a way of salvaging themselves in what was a, for them, a very catastrophic landscape. There is this sense that the individual self needs to find some way of communicating to the world and to others in a new way. The exact composition of the abstract expressionist movement is still a matter of debate, but over the decades since 1950, there has emerged a general consensus about a handful of key names. We think of Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, Franz Klein, Mark Rothko, Robert Motherwell, Arshul Gorky, and last, but certainly not least, Clifford Still. The memoirs of Still and Pollock and others describe very passionately the importance of painting. 
And one by one, they all developed this highly autobiographical signature style. And I think those American artists, uh, for all their differences, have many important properties that do bind them together. Almost all of the abstract expressionists by 1950 started to work in a scale that was somewhat unprecedented for a studio practice. Through scale, you could actually be in the painting. In fact, that's a common phrase that they would use is what it's like to be in the painting. It becomes an environment that you become of. The other quality that I think binds this group of artists is what's often referred to as all over compositions. The idea that in traditional art, there's usually a, a central image or subject, whether it's a portrait or a still life element, that is the center of our attention and probably the subject of that painting. In abstract expressionist compositions, the entire composition is the image. It's one thing. And so the left corner is equally as important as what's going on in the center. Or in the case of Clifford Still's work, there's little touches of color that make appearances almost in surprising ways to draw attention to the entire surface of the picture. So our eyes are continuously moving over these abstract expressionist paintings, trying to find an image to rest on, but in fact that's part of the game. We're constantly moving over these images just as the artists were as they were painting them. Helen Frankenthaler would embrace abstract expressionism and become one of the most admired artists of her generation. But she would refine and develop Jackson Pollock's technique of splatter and dripping paint by pouring pigment directly onto canvas laid on the floor. Where Pollock had used enamel paint that rested on raw canvas like skin, Frankenthaler poured turpentine thin paint in watery washes onto the raw canvas so that it soaked into the fabric weave, becoming one with it. The result were waves of transparent, soft, flowing color shapes and line. Her staining method also brought a new, open airiness to the painted surface. You can't really appreciate this painting until you see its monumental size and scale. Helen Frankenthaler more or less stumbled on her stain technique, she said, first using it in creating this work entitled Mountains and Sea, done in 1952. She painted it on her return to New York from a trip to Nova Scotia. The painting captures the light hills, rocks, and water in a delicate balance of drawing and painting, using fresh washes of color, predominantly blues and pinks. As she created this work, she said, quote, the landscapes were in my arms as I did it. I didn't realize all that I was doing. I was trying to get at something. I didn't know what until it was manifest. She later described the seemingly unfinished painting, which can be seen at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. She described it as, quote, well, it looked to many people like a large paint rag, casually accidental and incomplete. I love this photo of Helen Frankenthaler in her studio, sitting on and surrounded by painted canvases. She is so immersed in color that she has become part of the paintings themselves. One of the goals of abstract expressionism, to be part of the painting. This photo was part of a photo essay for Life magazine taken by Gordon Parks in 1956. Unlike many of her painter colleagues at the time, she came from a prosperous Manhattan family. She was born on 
December 12, 1928, one of three daughters of Alfred Frankenthaler, a New York State Supreme Court judge, and the former Martha Lowenstein, an immigrant from Germany. From early childhood, she was interested in art. In fact, she would dribble nail polish into a sink full of water to watch the color flow. She attended the exclusive Dalton School in Manhattan, then went on to Bennington College, where cubism was all the rage. As a self-described saddle-shoed girl a year out of Bennington, she made her way into the New York art world. With a boost from Clement Greenberg, the reigning art critic and advocate of abstract expressionism, whom she met in 1950, and with whom she would have a five-year relationship. Through Clement Greenberg, she met the big names in abstract expressionism, Jackson Pollock, his wife and fellow artist Lee Krasner, William and Elaine de Cooney. In this photo from July of 1952 on the beach in East Hampton, she's sunny with Jackson Pollock on the far left, Clement Greenberg, and Lee Krasner, Jackson Pollock's wife, on the right. I'm hoping they all were using sunscreen, especially Pollock and Greenberg on those bald heads, but I don't think sunscreen had been invented yet. In 1958, she married artist Robert Motherwell, the two of them seen here on their wedding day, and a new art world power couple of the 1950s was born. Like her, Robert Motherwell came from a well-to-do family and the golden couple, as they were known in the cash poor and backbiting art world at the time, spent several leisurely months honeymooning in Spain and France before coming back to their apartment on the Upper East Side of New York. Robert Motherwell's art, as we see in this painting, was also an artist who liked big, old paintings of shape and color, as in Elegy to the Spanish Republic number 126. He would do many paintings of this size and scale inspired by the same theme. <clears throat> In Manhattan, they removed themselves from the downtown art scene and established themselves in a house on East 94th Street, where they developed a reputation for lavish entertaining. There's Helen Frankenthaler there, beaming at the camera. Helen loved to entertain, said Ann Friedman, the former president of Nodler and Company, Helen Frankenthaler's art dealer. She enjoyed feeding people and engaging in lively conversation, and she liked to dance. In fact, you could see it in her movements as she worked on her paintings, said Ann Friedman. Her passion for dancing was more than fulfilled in 1985, when at a White House dinner to honor the Prince and Princess Diana of Wales, she was partnered with a fast stepper who had just been twirling Princess Diana. Helen Frankenthaler would say about this dance at the White House, quote, I'd waited a lifetime for a dance like this. She talked about this in a 1997 op-ed article for the New York Times. She went on to say, quote, my dance partner was great but she had no idea who he was until later when she showed her studio assistant the card her dance partner had given her with his name on it. John Travolta. Helen 
Alan Frankenthaler titled this painting, Nature Abhors a Vacuum, done in 1973. It's on view at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Although she rarely discussed the sources of her abstract imagery, they reflected her impressions. Here, her impressions of landscape, her meditations on personal experience, and the sheer pleasure of just dealing with paint. Visually diverse, her paintings were never produced in serial themes, like those we saw last week by Richard Demon Corn in his Ocean Park series. She looked on each of her works as a separate exploration. Critics have not unanimously praised Ellen Frankenthaler's art. Some have seen it as thin in substance, uncontrolled in method, too sweet in color, too poetic. But her work has gained universal admiration. The critic Barbara Rose wrote in 1972 of Helen Frankenthaler's gift for, quote, the freedom, spontaneity, openness, and complexity of an image, not exclusively of the studio or the mind, but explicitly and intimately tied to nature and human emotions. I think her painting here called Tutti Frutti, the 1966 captures the playful joy of painting color, the freedom to express herself that Frankenthaler's work so wonderfully fulfill. Also this painting called Alberta, done in 1975. Orange, yellows, pinks, a dash of blue. They could evoke a blazing sunset of sky and setting sun and water, or ju just Frankenthaler's delight in painting orange and pink and yellow and blue. She would say, quote, what concerns me when I work is not whether the picture is a landscape or whether it's pastoral or whether somebody will see a sunset in it. What concerns me is, did I make a beautiful picture? She would also boldly state, there is no formula. There are no rules. Let the picture lead you where it must go. Listen, listen a little more to Helen Frankenthaler talking about her work. I think most things are about ambiguity. The fact that things are the same, but not the same. Uh, they're repeated, but they're different. Uh, colors might be the same, and shapes might be the same, and lines might be the same, and weight and texture might be the same. But given the fact that they are placed in different spots or felt in different ways, they are repetitions, but they're totally different moments and millimeters of experience. I felt more and more that the drawing should come from what the shapes of the colors are, rather than I am arranging this with lines or confinements or patterns. And I do very much believe in drawing, especially when it doesn't show as drawing. When I talk about drawing, I mean, how are you getting your space? not where is the pencil going. I think I always drew with color at a certain moment rather than using line per se 
as a rope or a lasso or a wire, uh, a black thin line, instead of using that to uh, allocate or hold spaces, I tried consciously and otherwise to provide space without line, but to delineate line in other ways. Meaning, if you join a fat shape with a fat orange shape or green shape or mud shape, and it's joined to something else or not to something else, or it's placed in the right spot, then that particular line or formation of color and colors creates a kind of line that moves in space and yet rests on the surface. I did a lot of pictures one period that were essentially one color and I used tape as drawing and I moved the tape according to where I wanted it to work in space. And a lot of it was sort of luck. It, paint would seep under it or I would lift portions and let the painting seep under it or push the liquid under it and then quickly stop it. Uh, or feel, let's see what there is when I pull this tape up. And then I would add or subtract to it. I myself was surprised to see the slow emergence in the recent half decade or so of thicker paint. What I call, for want of a better word, clumps or raises or heavy dotting of pigment. These appear slowly and without warning, almost creeping up on me. However, they must work in space along with, if not often, after color itself. In other words, color itself or pigment itself is meaningless. There are lifelong marks that become assimilated that appear and reappear throughout decades. To identify and osmosize the past and present around you and go naturally, creatively free, head, heart, and wrists, to be in control enough not to be in control at all, to have a dialogue with the work and let yourself go in relation to it. Paintings don't lie. They have their beautiful working order, just as nature itself has. One cliche I use on myself all the time, it's the one rule is no rules. And if you have a real sense of limits, then you're free to break out of them. The end. So when Chris throws out the whole idea of just letting the color and paint with a little guidance just go where it wants to go and do what it wants to do. If you're the artist Frank Stella, you still love just painting beautiful colors, but it's how you paint them that can make a difference. Frank Stella was born in 1936 in Malden, Massachusetts, and he arrived in New York in 1958. The ink barely dry on his diploma from Princeton. And like many young artists in post-war America, Frank Stella was initially smitten with abstract expressionism. But instead of drips and splatters, he would create something new. From 1967 to 1970, Frank Stella painted the Protractor series. We all remember those protractors from our geometry classes. He would do more than 100 paintings based on variations of the protractor drawn shape 
He wants to control and precisely design shapes and composition, technically determined by engineering and architectural design tools, like a protractor and a straight edge and a ruler. And the color is flat, smooth, no sign of a brush stroke or the hand of the artist at work. Where Pollock splattered and Frankenthaler poured paint, Stella would control the application of paint with technical virtuosity and a graphic sense of design. All colors are carefully chosen according to their saturation and value to strike a balance between the illusion of space and flatness. To achieve this effect, Stella mixed colors himself, combining acrylic and fluorescent pigments. You might be surprised, but Stella has cited the work of Henri Matisse in relation to this period of work. I think you'll recall that Richard Diebenkorn also paid homage to Matisse in the inspiration for his paintings, as we looked at last week. In 1970, Frank Stella commented, quote, I would like to combine the abandon and indulgence of Matisse's dance, the painting we see here, in my own work. But artists change, evolve. And I think Frank Stell is one of the best examples of that. In most recent years, Stell's work has radically evolved from hard edge shapes, flat color and precise lines and curves into a much more free form expression. Abstract expressionism rears its head again. more so than in this monumental work by Frank Stella. It feels much more like an homage to abstract expressionism than his earlier protractor works. Here we see all the glory and messy and exuberant color and shapes of abstract expressionism. Hard not to compare it with Jackson Pollock's 1952 mind-blowing and art world shattering painting. And sculptural three-dimensional reliefs become the work that Stella is doing. He'll maintain the protractor and French curve drawing tools, but instead of the hard edges, they now inspire flowing, free form, swirling shapes of color and dimension. Their cobbled together elements jangle all over, front, back, and sides, with improvised brushwork and even trips of paint. In 2015, the Whitney gave Frank Stella a major retrospective. And this will give you kind of an idea of the installation and the panorama and the size and impact of Stella's work. In one viewing area, we see the whole span of his work from his early protractor series to his free form sculptural works that dominated his work most recently. Let's learn a little bit more about Frank Stella and this 
landmark retrospective in this video. Frank Stella, a retrospective, is the first major retrospective of the artist's work in the United States in almost three decades. It really covers the entire span, six decades of his work. And there's an extraordinary array of artistic styles, themes, and content. Frank Stella was born in Malden, Massachusetts in 1936, studied art at Phillips Academy in Massachusetts, and then at Princeton University before moving to New York City in 1958. In 1959, at the age of only 23, Stella completely transformed the history of art when he first showed his famous black paintings. These extraordinary paintings seemed very simple in their concept, but they were very radical in their implications. They seemed to banish not only illusionistic space, but any possibility of narrative or symbolic content. He famously said, what you see is what you see. Painting to me is a brush and a bucket, and you put paint on the surface, and that's it. There's nothing else. As viewers walk through the exhibition, it's essentially chronological, and in a sense what they're doing is going on Stella's journey. It begins with the now iconic black aluminum and copper paintings. It progresses to the shaped canvases that helped to completely transform art in the 1960s. In the 1970s and 80s, it explodes into low, medium, and high relief works that really subvert the traditional definitions of painting and create a new form of sort of hybrid painting and sculpture. At the age of 80, Frank Stella is still creating innovative and exciting new work. As early as the 1980s, Stella was already utilizing computers to help model the designs for his beautiful circuit relief constructions. But today, he's using not only computer-aided design, but also rapid prototyping and 3D printing. In a sense, uh, Stella is an old master working with new technologies. Frank Stella has had an extraordinary degree of influence on the history of post-war modern art and abstraction. Uh, first and foremost, he's often perceived as the father of minimalism. Looking back over the last 60 years of Frank Stella's work, it's possible that his greatest single influence hasn't been on any particular art movement per se, but more his sort of go-for-broke mentality, the idea that Despite all his fame and all his success, both critically and commercially, he continually looked for a new mode of expression, a new kind of painting, a new kind of relief, even a new kind of sculpture that would continue to keep the history of abstraction vital and relevant to modern viewers. So before we go on to our next artist, William de Kooning, but maybe we could just pause for a moment. <laughs> We've just seen a lot of art, a lot of art by artists who really did change modern art as we know it and still continue to surprise and delight us. If there were a few questions or comments, uh, we can do some shout outs here or raise your hand or whatever, or use a little chat app down at the bottom of your screen. Hi, hi Bob, it's Loretta. Yes, just to, if you'd like, uh, you can type your question into the chat or the Q&A. Um, it's so, I was just thinking, Bob, it's so amazing to what, where we started with the Wyas and, and where we are now, it's it's really an amazing breadth of uh, of artists. Um, I'm wondering if you have a favorite of, um, or you can think about that and and talk to us at the end, or why you might have a favorite of these. I know that's a broad question, but just plan yeah. that. One. Yeah, I could probably kind of point out a few of my favorite works. Uh, one of the things is I. Have put these art lectures together. I learn a lot about the artist. I know, you know, 
something about most of them uh, and no works which I particularly like, but who knew that Helen Frankenthaler liked to dance? <laughs> dance with John Travolta at the White House, uh, you know, and uh, who knew that Frank Stella was a preppy, he went to Exeter, <laughs> who knew? But what you mentioned when we started with the Wyeths, uh, three generations, and then we went out west with artists working in the 20th century, now back in post-war New York, all that art is happening simultaneously, <laughs> most of it. I mean, Andrew Wyeth and Jamie Wyeth, you know, Deeb and Korn, you know, uh, uh, it's uh, George O'Keefe. They're working in this mid 20th century space, in this post-war space. But look at the variety. Look at the different types of work. But I think there is a lot of um, continuity and influence uh, going on. Uh, and as we started with Pollock, and then we see Frank Stella go to the hard edge, flat works that, you know, he made his debut and reputation and voila, He's basically come back to abstract expressionism. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my so there is a quick question, Bob, from Sonia uh, Nunez: Is is Frank Stella still producing art? Very good question, uh, and one of, and I don't know the answer. The, you know, uh, hopefully, what these art lectures will do might inspire the attendees to go to uh, Professor Google and uh, do a little more uh, research. That's probably what you would enter in Google, because <laughs> Frank Stell is still making art. But also I do encourage you go to Google Images and also go to YouTube, which is where I found, well, most of my videos uh, kind of continue the journey. We're just kind of on the surface here. We could have spent, we could spend our entire hour plus together on any one of these artists. So uh, hopefully that will, you'll be inspired to, to kind of do a little bit of further exploration on your own. Thank you. So I think we can keep moving on if you'd like to Great. move on to de Kooning. And, and all is looking good with slides and videos. Everything yeah. is working. Every, everything is okay. <laughs> good. I won't ask again. I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> William de Kooning. So how did this penniless, young, Dutch stowaway transform into America's first art superstar? And along the way, help forge an incendiary new art movement called Abstract Ex Impression and Expression. Now I add to this, a tumultuous personal life and marriage to another famous artist, Elaine de Cooney. A willful disregard for convention and throw in an ongoing revolution in the New York art scene. All this not only made William de Kooning a celebrity, but some argue eventually shifted the epicenter of the art world itself from Paris to the Big Apple, with a little help from Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko. William de Kooning was born in Rotterdam in 1904, and at the age of 22, he would stow away on a British freighter bound for Argentina. Why was he going to Argentina? I don't know. <laughs> That's probably in a lengthy biography. However, he changed course and he jumped ship in Newport News, Virginia, and made his way up to New York City, finding work as a carpenter, a house painter, and a commercial artist. 
and in his spare time, painting a small studio in Hell's Kitchen on West 44th Street. His early work would reflect the dominating influence of post-World War II abstract expressionism as seen in this painting from 1955 entitled Composition. De Kooning's wife, Elaine, was also a noted painter and had shown her lyrical abstract paintings at New York's Betty Parsons Gallery, which had also launched the careers of Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock. Here we see one of Elaine de Kooning's work, Bullfight, done in 1960. It's the Museum of Modern Art. And on the right, Elaine de Kooning in her studio. The de Koonings would have what was widely rumored to be called a open relationship from their wedding in 1943 until Elaine's death in 1989. Both de Koonings were known for their sexual promiscuity. He had several partners, but she had many more. Elaine de Kooning was said by all who knew her to have been a legendary beauty and feisty femme fatale who chose many of her lovers who would advance her husband's career like prominent art critic Harold Rosenberg. Also Tom Hess, the trend-setting editor of Art News and Charles Egan, a leading New York gallery owner. Wilm de Kooning was a masterful draftsman, as we see on the left, in this sensitive pencil drawing of his wife, Elaine, done in 1940. That same year, he would paint her portrait in bold color, reminiscent of Picasso's Cubist versions and visions of women. De Kooning's lifelong love affair with women as a powerful force an enduring inspiration would influence and inspire so many of his paintings. Between 1950 and 1953, de Kooning would produce a series of six paintings depicting a three quarter length female figure. His first painting in this series was a disaster, he would say. He would repeatedly change and paint out the image until January or February of 1952, when the painting was abandoned and unfinished. The art historian Mary Meyer Shapiro saw the painting in de Kooning's studio soon afterwards and encouraged the artist to persist. The painting was completed. Woman number one oil, enamel, and charcoal on canvas. It's in the Museum of Modern Arts collection. He would then go on to do six versions. Number three, when they were exhibited together, all six, for the first time at the Sydney Janus Gallery in March of 1953, they caused an uproar among many artists and critics who felt that de Kooning had betrayed the ideals of abstract expressionism, which rejected subject and especially figurative representations. An important influence on de Kooning's figurative art were Mesopotamian figurines he would see on display at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. The wide eyes, smiles, prominent breasts, and tapering arms of these figures are echoed in the features of his painting of women. But there's also the grotesque grinning mouths displayed by all the women in this series. 
This may have been a result of de Kooning's habit of cutting out the mouths of magazine pinups and attaching them to his work. He would write, I quote, I cut out a lot of mouths. First of all, I thought everything ought to have a mouth. Maybe it was like a pun, maybe it's sexual, but whatever it is, I used to cut out a lot of mouths and then I painted those figures and then I put the mouth more or less in the place where it was supposed to be. It always turned out to be very beautiful and it helped me immensely to have this real thing, unquote. <laughs> Thus says the artist, William de Cooney. <laughs> but in later years, de Cooney would increasingly abandon the figure and move to pure abstraction, as in this canvas that erupts in the pure joy of painting, wild, free brushstrokes of beautiful color. This painting was done in 1977 and it's in a private collection. Elaine and William both struggle with alcoholism throughout their lives which eventually led to their separation in 1957. While separated, Elaine remained in New York, struggling with poverty. And William moved to Long Island, Long Island and dealt with depression, despite bouts with alcoholism. They both continued painting. Although separated for nearly 20 years, they never divorced and ultimately reunited in 1976. It was revealed that towards the end of his life, de Kooning had begun to lose his memory in the late 1980s and had been suffering from Alzheimer's for some time. This revelation has initiated considerable debate, debate among scholars and critics about how responsible de Kooning was for the creation of his late work. Succumbing to the progression of his disease, de Kooning painted his final works in 1991. He died in 1997, at the age of 93. There were some who rumored that his wife, Helen Franklin, that his wife, Elaine de Kooning, may have painted or at least finished some of his last works. One of his notable visitors to Long Island was Paul McCartney to his studio. We had our intermission, so we will keep moving. In 1996, pop art has come onto the scene. Some describe this as the death of abstract expressionism. No more swashes and swirls of paint on canvas. The subject matter was now mass culture, not inner emotions, not physical painting. And like abstract expressionism, it too was born in New York City in shouts. America. Artist Roy Lichtenstein would celebrate comic book art in his paintings. Andy Warhol would define pop art with a silkscreen painting of a Campbell's soup can. So if comic books and Campbell's soup cans are subjects for art, Why not the American flag? What could be more American than the American flag? Even three American flags. Even better. In 1954, Jasper Johns began painting what would become a series inspired 
by the American flag. But what may seem simple is much more complex. The execution and composition of three flags done in 1958, which can be seen at the Whitney Museum of American Art, elicits close inspection by the viewer. The painting draws attention to the process of its making through John's use of encaustic painting, a mixture of pigment suspended in warm wax that congeals each brushstroke as it's applied, congeals and hardens. The resulting accumulation of discrete marks creates a sensuous, almost sculptural surface. Encaustic painting is as old as the Egyptians' paintings of portraits on a mummy's sarcophagus. Johnson, Johns would find endless inspiration trying out new ideas about his flags. Change the colors, the green and yellow, or white on white. Endlessly exploring many variations on the flags. One night I dreamed I painted a large American flag. And the next morning I got up and I went out and bought materials to begin it. Because some things I stitched onto the, on, onto the canvas with thread. It's a very rotten painting because I began it in like uh, house enamel paint. And it wouldn't dry quick enough. And then I had in my head this idea of something I had read, I heard, I don't know what, about wax encaustic. And I changed in the middle of the painting for that because the encaustic just has to cool and then it's hard and you don't, you don't blur it again. Johns described his flags and targets as things the mind already knows. A stark contrast with the art of the abstract expressionists whose images could be read as emotional Rorschach tests. The people who followed and did imitation abstract expressionism were fairly boring and there was a hiatus, there was a dull moment there in American art, and uh, there was a longing, there was a need for something to happen. Johns proposed a cooler alternative, using real things as a point of departure, but only as a formal device. The paintings that followed immediately, which were paintings of, of uh, targets and numbers, uh, gave me the same opportunity to, to feel removed from the work, neutral toward it, um, involved in the making, but not involved in the judging of it. The activity of making, just the process, was preeminent in Jasper. And the results seemed like they would take care of itself once the supposition was stated, whether it was going to be a map or a target or whatever, then it gave him a great freedom to um, intensely follow the program within the limitation that he set for himself. It's not, it's not just, it doesn't just refer to things which uh, are images, but even ways of doing things within a painting, ways of painting. You, if it occurs to me that there is a way of painting that I can introduce into my, my work that I have not uh, used before, that somehow I will become a more skillful artist. <laughs> I don't know that that's true at all. J. 
Jasper Johns would explore painting targets incorporated into a box construction that includes a row of four tiny human face sculptures in target with four faces in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Pause and paints number, some of my favorite works of his. His number series began in the summer of 1960 using the superimposed numbers zero to nine. John lets the process of painting the numbers sequence dictate the structure of the painting, as we see on the right. This allowed him to concentrate on the qualities of the paint itself, exploring color and thickness. And he would paint maps. Again, exploring in line and color in infinite ways to make the ordinary and familiar endlessly new and extraordinary. So if pop art is all surface, and as Andy Warhol would say, well, what you see is what you see. Jasper John seems to be going deeper, forcing us to look and see more than the surface. In fact, with each drawn line, layer on layer of brush strokes and application of paint on canvas, in his own way, he's celebrating abstract expressionism. Jasper Johns will explore throughout his career as one of our greatest living artists, accessible and familiar iconic motifs, not just the map of the United States, but simple cross hatches those we doodle. He transforms these into patterns of rich color and design. As in this triptych painting done in 1973. But he also explores sculpture. And in the 1960s, Jasper Johns creates sculptural works, taking the age old painter's tools of a coffee can holding brushes, he casts it in bronze, a sovereign coffee can stacked with brushes, and then applies paint. The object will become the inspiration for other works. Here incorporates the crosshatch motif as a background in this lithograph done in 1977 on the left. And we see the original inspiration painted bronze in 1960 on the right. He continues to explore the three dimensionality of paint and canvas and objects in this painting. Fool's House, the full-length painting is on the right. Fool's House, a metaphor for the artist's studio. Here, the broom is the paintbrush, painting the canvas but used to sweep the floors. In the lower part of the work are stretchers for small canvases. And in the very lower right, a little bit hard to see because it's white on white, is a coffee cup hanging from a nail nailed into the canvas. It's a beautiful presentation of grays and all the colors in grays. But it's also an action painting. 
Jackson Pollock would be inspired in his action paintings of dripping and splashing and tossing paint on the canvas. We feel that here, but also little notations that the artist has written on the canvas. It's an autobiographical painting. It's the artist, the artist studio, without seeing the artist, but certainly the hand of the artist at work. Jasper John's paintings would become more introspective, more autobiographical and figurative as in this work done in 1985, where a dominant silhouetted figure appears. Is it the artist? The figure is surrounded by clues, and images and details from motifs we've seen in his works, American flags, crosshatch, but we also see in the lower right, the hand of time. Time is moving, time is changing. This would become one of four paintings in a series depicting the four seasons. The mysterious silhouetted figure appears in each panel. Each panel surrounded with fragments of the images, objects, and motifs Johns has been painting for over 70 years. Ideas, objects, images that engage the artist and viewer with themes involving memory, sexuality, and the contemplation of mortality through the four seasons. So vast, endlessly inventive and expressive is his body of work that one museum couldn't do it justice in the most recent retrospective. This past year, both the Whitney and the Philadelphia Museum of Art held major retrospectives of Jasper John's works. I was fortunate to see the Jasper Johns retrospective in Philadelphia. And it was quite wonderful walking up those steps and seeing the giant banners of his crosshatch paintings hanging between the neoclassical pillars of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I also noticed that, and those of you who have been there, uh, down to the lower right is the Rocky statue. <laughs> it's not by Rodin, but it reminds you of Rodin, of Rocky. And most of the people were having their selfies done in front of that particular <laughs> work of art. This show really had some of Jasper John's really just great works on display. I'm so glad I got to see it. In 2011, President Barack Obama presents our artist Jasper Johns with the Medal of Freedom in the East Room of the White House. I want to close sharing a video honoring this artist. Hope I have it here. Whoops, I don't. But I had that, but I don't. Uh, that will be your homework assignment to go to YouTube and see uh, President Obama uh, presenting Jasper Johns with the Medal of Freedom. So that concludes our art journey today. And I've enjoyed spending this time with so many of you over the last three weeks as we looked at uh, artists from the 20th century. I know we looked at a lot of art, a lot of 
my favorite art, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. So now would be a great time for any of your questions or comments. Uh, and uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. That has been a, a wonderful series. I really appreciate your time and lending your expertise uh, for this series. Uh, you had mentioned you went to Philadelphia for that. Do you have any uh, other shows you're planning to see this this year coming up? Oh boy, good good question. Uh, the, the, the going down to Philadelphia in the late <laughs> late fall was kind of coming out of two years of hibernation with uh, COVID. We were there with some very good friends of ours uh, who love art as much as we do. So it was great. Uh, I also visited for the first time the Barnes Collection in Philadelphia. It was wonderful, wonderful experience. Uh, art shows coming up. Um, let's see, there's a good show that for those of us who are living so nearby here in Connecticut, up at the New Britain on the Hudson River School of Landscape Artists, Hudson River School, the mid 19th century school of painters. I think you will enjoy that. Um, and as far as, as kind of getting back out into the world, <laughs> Uh, kind of looking forward to doing that. Those of you who uh, are nearby New Haven, as Guilford is, um, um, the Yale Center for British Art, uh, where I have been a docent for many, many years, has um, reopened. And uh, I hope uh, you can uh, get down there to uh, see what's going on, not only at the uh, British Center, but of course, across the street at the Yale University Art Gallery. I think that the fact that we have two of the world's great art museums free, open to the public across the street from each other is, is quite, quite, uh, quite wonderful. It's a good idea to make a plan and you forget that they're there, so. I, I agree. It it's, makes for a great day to go into New Haven and check out. Oh, it, it, it really, it really does. And, and do take advantage of, of, of that nearby opportunity for sure. Just go to their website, see what's, see what's going on there. Well, thank you so much, Bob. A, a couple of nice notes from Judy. What a wonderful series. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us uh, and more kudos in the chat. So thank you again. And one just just you mentioned a, a show that I'm looking forward to seeing. It's at the uh, Yale Center for British Art, because as we were looking at these artists from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, into into our century, and uh, we're looking at American artists. Oftentimes, people ask, "So, what was going on over the uh, you know pond in Britain, in London?" That wasn't really the epicenter of modern art during this period, but one of the artists and a major retrospective, the first time in 40 years you've seen her work is the British uh, artist, Bridget Riley. And I must admit, I didn't know a lot about Bridget Riley. Uh, and I've learned a lot about Bridget Riley and her work and her practice and her inspirations. And uh, on view, just opened a week ago at the Yale Center is Bridget Riley's work. Um, she would probably be thought of more in the kind of flat color, sharp curved edges of compositions as we might think of Frank Stella. Uh, but uh, she is still practicing and uh, again, uh, I'm looking forward, I've only seen her work, you know, online, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing her work in person. It's two full floors of her work at the British Center. So Bridget Riley uh, spent a little time, again, on Google Images and uh, 
Uh, uh, before you go, do you do you mind uh, circling back to our question of uh, this is from Susan Glantz? Would you mind telling us a few of your favorite works from these artists? Uh, I know people are probably getting ready to go, but if you you know want to pick one or two, you know, it's interesting. Back back in the day, I, I must be honest, never a huge fan of Jackson Pollock. I uh, certainly appreciate what, what he was doing. I became much more of a fan of Helen Frankenthaler. Uh, and I think it's because of kind of the lyricism of her work, her paintings that thin pigments flowing across the canvas. Huge fan of Jasper Johns. Not so much the flag paintings. I think I mentioned his his number drawings, the idea of taking zero through nine large stencils and one number on top of the other, making art of out of the, such the commonplace. And also a very big fan of Frank Stella. And I think one of the things I found so interesting in today's, uh, as we talked, his evolution is kind of that. Ah, Forget the drips and the drabs of abstract expressionism. I'm going to something very different, flat, hard edged, beautiful color. Um, yet look at his later works. So um, I think kind of what I like about uh, much of the work we have looked at, and when we looked at in our first uh, lecture on the Wyas, an artist who I came to really like maybe because he's a contemporary, it was Jamie Wyeth. You know, third generation of the Wyeths, that's a tough spot to be in. That's like being Frank Sinatra Jr. You don't remember too many of his singing performances now, do you? And here you have Jamie Wyeth uh, exploring, creating his own unique work. Uh, that was so much fun looking at his work and learning more, and particularly that he was one of the denizens of Andy Warhol's studio back in the day. Uh, who knew? Uh, so enjoyed that. And then uh, I think last week, uh, I think I think looking at the Diebenkorns and the Richard Diebenkorns particularly, but also seeing his influence of Matisse. Uh, and and uh, his drawings, a uh, wonderful thing to explore is just Stephen Korn's uh, little drawing books. He always had a sketchbook with him, always had a sketchbook. And uh, so again, um, so much art to look at, so little time. But uh, I've enjoyed doing this. I know all of you will continue to explore and learn more about these artists. And I certainly encourage you to do that. And if this series has inspired you to do that, then I would deem it a success. So thanks so much for getting together and uh, hope we can get together again in the future. And again, thanks to the uh, Guilford Library and SIL for hosting this series. Thank you, Bob. Wonderful series. Thank Have you a good so day, everyone. Bye-bye now. <laughs>